What is passion? No, seriously. All right. So there are thousands upon thousands of definitions for passion. But for now, let's look at the definition the dictionary of Merriam-Webster offers. So it says, intense emotion, compelling action. Think about it. Intense emotion, compelling action. Sounds a bit raw, doesn't it? Let's decode it. So the social science of the day is clear about the science of passion. And the social science suggests that there are three steps to the passion and any passionate person takes into making it, right? So the first one being knowledge, right? The first step is knowledge. And the second is realization of passion or emotional backbone of it, you can call. And the third one being the determination to act. Still sounds a bit raw, doesn't it? Let's exemplify it. And let's look at the example of a father asking for his son to bring the keys. And for the son to know that the person asking him to do that is his father would be knowledge. And then from that knowledge, he drives an emotional backbone. He understands that this is my father, so I should feel respect towards him. And therefore, wouldn't I, why wouldn't I do what he says to me to do? And why wouldn't I bring those keys? And that's when he realizes that this is part of passion. And then he doesn't need much energy, he doesn't need much of a thought process, he is determinant. From that moment on, he drives enough reason, he has concrete, solid reason to get up and bring those keys to his father. And now this seems okay, and moving on. So why would you think that if we have those three steps, and the social science is saying everything is clear, just take those three steps and make it, like Albert Einstein, like Nikola Tesla, right? Why wouldn't you do that if it's so clear? Why are you sitting here? Oh, why are you not pursuing all your passions? Why are you not becoming the next, I don't know, Michael Jordan? Well, I have my reasons for that. And this is absolute maximum of distractions. Let's decode this as well. And the first one being long schooling. Why long schooling? Because throughout the world, whether all the school systems have 10 to 12 year old schooling programs in USA, in Russia, in Uzbekistan, in China, wherever you look, it's 10, 11, 12 year old schooling program. And it's not said to the kids that, okay, look, here, you study those 20 subjects at a basic fundamental level for three, four years, and then you are free to go and choose whatever you like the most. And then concentrate most of your time to that science, to that subject. No, they're not being told that. They're saying, the schooling program is saying, you go study those 20, 12 years, and we don't care about your passion, basically. And this is one of the reasons that disrupts this process of finding a passion and grinding on it really hard. Next, the second step being television. Well, just television is an example to that. But a deeper root cause for that would be hedonic adaptations. Hedonic adaptations are when you, are, you get used to something really, really good, and then after that, going back wouldn't feel that good. Like in an example of a kid, for example, when he tries an ice cream for the first time, he wouldn't love the taste of a carrot the second time he tries it, right? After an ice cream. It wouldn't feel that good after something sweeter hits, right? And that's an adaptation. And that's a basic principle that works generally for anything. When you get used to television, when you get used to Instagram, when you get used to any social media platform, you're used to Netflix, then studying on your exams, doing your homework for three, four hours straight wouldn't feel that good. So this process is disrupted as well. And the third reason being internet. Well, here internet is also uh, just an exemplar, right? And the main reason behind internet being exemplified is shortening attention spans. What is it, attention span? Attention span is one's ability to concentrate on a thing before the first feeling of boredom, before the first feeling of, I don't want to do this anymore, hits. So a healthy person has 30, uh, 25 to 30 minutes of attention span. Usually, the biology works this way. Well, at least neurosurgeons say so, right? 
And then in the beginning of the media, in the beginning of the filming industry, we had films with two hour long, we had basically two hour long films. And then we started feeling uh, sore. We started feeling bored with those two hour films. They were hard to follow. Tough to be, tough to keep the, keep the viewers all the time, right? And then they shortened it to one hour long videos, one hour long films. And then this felt long as well. And then the YouTube hit. YouTube era hit as well. And then we have an average video of seven to 10 minutes long videos and everyone going watching them. So films won't feel that great after YouTube. And we're getting used to our, our attention spans are clicking to those seven, 10 minutes. We don't want to watch one hour long video, right? And then the YouTube, after the YouTube industry, we have something called Instagram. I'm sure all of you uh, know what Instagram is might probably be addicted to it in a way, right? And those videos are uh, on average two, three minutes long. Like Reels, Instagram videos are two, three minutes long. And so after you watch those two, three minute long videos on daily basis and you, don't, you prefer these videos over everything, over two hour long videos or one hour long videos, over 30 minute videos, your attention span, your uh, neural networks, your brain function works, the, works this way and says, I want to focus two, three minutes. If I don't like it, I skip it. This is my maximum now. So you are training your limits of your brain function to getting used to, to lowering its standards from two hour longs and then from hour, then two, three minutes. And then we have something called TikTok, where videos are only one minute, right? And you watch only one minute videos. How, did that, how does that feel? You like something, you watch it. And maximum length to which you watch it it. You watch a video, you like it, one minute. Don't like it, swap. Don't like it, swipe. Don't like it, swipe. So your attention span is essentially crushed. You don't have any attention span. Forget about those six hour study sessions. Forget about those two hour long lectures. Forget about, forget about a lot of things, basically, where you need consistency, where you need attention. Forget about them. Your attention span is crushed. And basically, these three reasons are representations of uh, bigger problems, root causes of these problems that we have. These are only examples. Moving on to another slide. So how do we break this? If we know that there are three steps, but we have these problems on our way, we have these barriers, how do we get through them? How do we break this cycle? Well, first, we extract the universal principles from the lives of the greats. Because whoever, after whoever, if not them, right? If not, if not Einstein, who else? If not Tesla, who else? Because those are the people that did it. Those are the people that dedicated their lives to it. Those are the people who studied for those six, 12 hour sessions, burned that midnight oil, right? With their lives and then extract universal principles that lie, that also work for our lives. The second, step would be to apply those lessons to current realities. Because if you have only principles, only formulas, and you don't use them, what the benefit you have, right? And surprise, surprise, we already did those steps. We already extracted the rules, if you were uh, attentive enough, after that TikTok generation, of course. And the next step is just applying them. Those three steps, study, realize your passion, and then grind. Those three steps, yes. Exactly. Nothing more. Those. So, and here we have an educational system which is exactly based upon the foundational principle of those three steps. Liberal arts education says, yes, we do realize it. And then we encourage and build our whole system on this three-step plan. And just look at the results this liberal, edu liberal arts education produce. Well, liberal arts students in USA make up less than 2% of all student population. Yet the results they produce make up more than 20% of all the high achievers in USA, most influential people in politics, Bush, Clinton, like in business, Bill Gates, Zuckerberg, all of them are liberal artists, if you know, right? And then another study by Chicago University found out that Nobel Prize winners are all, uh, are almost all invariably liberal artists. 
This is solid data, statistical information from Chicago University. And they say, it's all liberal, liberal arts, man. Just go for it, right? And when we look at the foundational principles of, the, of that liberal arts system, we see three main sciences being taught. Two language arts, grammar, rhetoric, and then logic, which in combination teach you how to decode the core principles of any argument being made, whether it be in a book of a person or a motif in a film, whatever. And then having realized that central thing, which is learning and mastery, you are free to go to pursue any other career, they say. Basically, they teach them th these three sciences, and then when they make hell of a learner with these three, three sciences out of any student, they say, now go study business, now go study politics. You are free to go, man. Just go do that. But first, you have to, it's just men that have to study these three sciences. And after that, yeah, surprise, surprise again. If you knew Harvard, Yale, Princeton are all liberal arts colleges. And when you see at, the, at their graduates, when you see at all those successful people making up that Forbes list, yeah, they are all graduates of these universities, which are liberal arts, which are based upon those three principles. And we have madrasa system. Now, this must be interesting, right? Because madrasa system, man, like, what's that? Madrasa system is easily, rawly looking at it, is liberal arts on steroids. Beefed up liberal arts, you can call. Why? Because remember we had two language sciences in liberal arts education? Well, guess what? We have 15 plus language sciences in madrasa system. 15 plus. And it's now sarf, ma'ani, sawt, arud, wada, and you name it, 15 plus sciences, which aren't like, we have them, we can teach you them, we can teach you them. No, it's mandatory. It's essential. If you don't study them, we don't allow you to just further your education. And people in those madrasa systems used to study all these sciences just as language sciences. And after them, they have a whole, whole bunch of other sciences that they are supposed to study throughout their 20 year, 30 year educational process, which was very tough and therefore, produced some of the most passionate and most professional and brightest minds that humanity has ever seen. We'll talk about them a bit later. But now let's look at the best examples of those madrasa systems. And the first one is Qarawiyin in Morocco, Fes, and it's a thousand, year, a thousand plus year old institution which produced some of the brightest human beings that humanity has ever, was, has ever happened to see. And the second is Al-Azhar, in Egypt, and this place is another hot spot for the brightest minds. The third one should be familiar to most of the viewers here, and it's Mir Arab in Bukhara. It's 500 plus year old institution, which is also famous for its 30 plus year old educational system. And this is where you get the most famous scientists in, all, in, in most fields. And let's look at their results. I mean, when you look at these educational systems, man, how don't, you, how don't you marvel? How don't you get excited, surprised about the achievements of the people who just dictated the numerals to the world? Yeah, yeah, dictated the numerals. Did you ever wonder about your one, two, threes that you use on daily basis? One, two, three, fours, numbers? Well, guess what? The graduates of those madrasa systems invented them. And how can you not marvel at the people whose passion invented algebra, invented optics, hospitals, congress, and the list goes on. Algebra takes its name from the foundational math book by Al-Kharizmi, Al-Jabr wal muqabla and, and the West just gave it, just gave to the whole science the name of a book that the person produced because it's so essential, so fundamental. And optics takes its roots back from the work uh, in the works of Ibn al-Haytham, who laid the foundations for the operational fundamental processes of the human eye. And he broke down all the principles, all the steps, all the main mechanisms in how eye works. And upon that, current technology, current science laid its all new sciences upon this in, this, in the areas of AI, 
AR, VR, even this projector, let's say, these screens, all those cameras that you use in your fancy phones, yes, they are all rely upon optics. Hospitals by Harun al-Rashid, who was caliph in the Muslim empire, he came up with an idea of joining all those doctors in one place and then letting them to more effectively treat all the ill. And he's the producer of the idea of hospitals. I mean, where would you go with your COVID, right, if we didn't have Harun al-Rashid? And the Congress, the whole idea of the Congress, meaning that the way in which all, literally all governments are governed throughout the world now is produced by a man called Umar ibn Khattab, which was, who was a caliph, the second caliph of the Muslim empire. And the list goes on. This is, you can look at the zillions and zillions of findings of the ideas that we might not have discovered yet. They are in manuscripts, lying. For example, in Tashkent, uh, Oriental Studies University in Tashkent, in Un we have 136,000 plus manuscripts yet being to be translated, yet to be discovered by scientists and to be looked upon. What do we have there? We don't even know, right? And lastly, how can you not marvel at the people whose passion led to the two-thirds of all stars being named after them? Why after them? Because whoever discovers whatever, he calls it by his name most of the time. And this is how it works. Two-thirds of all stars, can you imagine, is named by the graduates of an educational system who, which peaked, which showed its most brilliance between 7th to 15th centuries. But unfortunately, these days, we don't see that efficacy, that efficacy, unfortunately. And then finally, if you were patient enough and really paid attention to all these steps, we congratulate you and we surprise you with the fireworks. Sorry, there should have been fireworks, but the technical issues, right? So the last advice of ours goes like, every major change starts with passion, but for the passion to start, we need knowledge. Remember those step, three steps? Well, the first one is knowledge. When you study a lot of things and you get to know a lot of fields and sciences and you get to see what you're really good at, strong at, and what your weaknesses are, then you have a bird's eye view of a situation. And then you can say, I really like these two, three things and let me devote my life to it. And I have solid and concrete reasons behind that. And I don't really like these other the whole rest, basically. And then go on to pursuing your long journey with the grinding process. Well, yes, the first step is knowledge for that. And then those two steps follow along. And here at the end, we have a short clip prepared for you, inspired by these ideas. Thank you very much. Sorry.